so we can see that at the uh, the store in New York, of course, literally is, has become a museum to their uh, to their brand. You can see a bunch of artifacts there. But they actually have a, it's very interesting to have a performance space there, uh, and they also have a whole bunch of pictures, obviously with the consent of customers, um, are using this uh, to project the buy-in they get from celebrities. So there's a very nice picture of the uh, the Japanese actor, Otogiri Jo, for example, um, well, this is Japanese Chinese, um, there is a, as, a, as a key fan. Okay, now let's turn to Russ and Daughters, the case there. Uh, this is down the street, literally. Um, notice since 2014, now this is interesting because Russ and Daughters is a, is a very successful uh, delicatessen and they've got takeaway brands but they've actually turned this into a quite successful um, restaurant. Um, so serving very traditional, uh, a very modern take on traditional uh, Jewish, uh, East, Eastern European Jewish cuisine uh, with uh, the interesting twist of doing really good martinis in a classic kind of New York style. So of course, just simply using images of old images which show that this is a storied place is, is a significant tactic. Using artifacts, so although this restaurant is 2014, what they've done is they've literally brought in a whole range of the artifacts from the days when it was a delicatessen. Okay, uh, the decor itself uh, references an earlier period which is very much on trend uh, again. The menus, everything, the, uh, the sheer quality of the visual design is extraordinarily good, extraordinarily seductive. Um, and backed up, of course, by very high quality visuals on their website as well. And all of these pictures I've um, uh, ripped from the website, so you can go and have a look directly. Um, and of course, the cuisine and the representations of the queen cuisine, very distinctive in what it is. It is, it is, it is um, uh, a certain kind of Jewish cuisine, uh, which happens to go well with a martini. And uh, that's how they profile it. Um, and so we can see the images here and um, all very seductive. Okay, so I think the takeaway here is simply that we have uh, so many brand resources within our company, uh, within the companies. There are a lot of stuff in the storehouse and a lot of people who are of a less sentimental persuasion tend to think, oh, I'll just get rid of all that rubbish, clear it out. We all have to be, we have to be completely contemporary. But the truth is, if one seeks to be entirely contemporary, you're throwing away one of your greatest sources of competitive advantage because all new businesses are inherently contemporary. So all newcomers are contemporary. So you really have to leverage your origins um, while presenting it in a contemporary form. And that's where the digital communications design meets the artisan or meets the artifact, meets the story of foundations, um, of trials and tribulations of the past becomes a very persuasive uh, thing to do. Okay, now I'm a little bit kind of traumatized after that crash. I've, um, I, was, um, I, I will simply say as my opening comment um, to this question of COVID communications and Wasada, and we've had some several very eloquent posts on the site that at least from the professor's point of view, um, uh, I've never worked harder in my life <laughs> and I'm a physical wreck and I live in constant fear of exactly what's just happened here. It makes me just nauseous thinking in advance of, of running a class online and being completely responsible for it. The introduction to business is even scarier because you've got 200 students and you're just accidentally in for all and it's all over. Anyway, so I asked you to think about um, Wasada's COVID communications. What I propose now is just to quite randomly assign you to breakout rooms for a little bit, um, interact with each other, uh, have a frank conversation about how you think Masada has handled it, the positives and the negatives. And then if you could pick one person in each group just to make some comments when we come back to the class as a whole, we'll unmute you and you can summarize what people had to say. So just looking at the time, then we'll have to do it fairly quickly. I'm sorry we lost some time there. Um, maybe I'll put you into breakout rooms. Maybe let's take about, say, eight minutes. We aim to, to come back um, just at about four o'clock. 
um, I'll uh, assign you straight away. I noticed I dropped into most of the groups there. I think there's only one I missed. Um, I'm briefly lurking in everyone else's. A um, couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, generally for a good in, uh, interaction, it's always better to turn your cameras on. I, I was a little bit dismayed that it was uh, people were just simply talking and only their name was displayed. So they've all got wonderful faces. So I think you should show them to each other. Um, we can read each other's body language and just make those connections. Um, now, obviously, time is really tight, and I'm sorry we dropped out earlier. Uh, what I would like to ask is, uh, um, certainly for those groups who picked a person, and if you didn't, please feel free to do it as an individual, to use later on the um, forum function here in Moodle to just share a couple of um, takeaway points uh, from each group. Um, I'll make just a few comments based on what people said and of course from the professor's side, but also I want to emphasize I have, I have a, a son who's a fourth year university student in another institution. So I'm also paying as a, as a parent. Um, maybe I'm a, I'm a little bit softer on the universities because I'm a professor, I, I'm just resigned to paying. Um, clearly the service experience is diminished, you know, as, uh, a significant part of the campus you know, of university life is the campus experience and the connection and the physical space of the campus. And uh, it's very, very clear from this pandemic just how important, how meaningful that is to people. I've always been very conscious of this. If you if you come to the Waseda campus on the weekend, you can often see elderly folks walking around, very sentimental, revisiting the campus, maybe bringing their grandkids. Maybe, you know, you've got people in their 20s or 30s bringing their boyfriend or girlfriend to the campus or their young kids to, uh, to show the, where, they, where they spent a meaningful part of their lives. So this physical spatiality really matters. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a powerful takeaway. And it's obviously very frustrating to have to pay and to, to, to not have that. Um, Couple of things in terms of though the university, what, what do we buy? Uh, there was some very nice discussions in some groups, group one, for example. Um, you know, the point was made in a cynical way, you know, that the universities are saying, well, the degree is still worthwhile, um, therefore you should pay. Well, this is one of the fundamental truths of university education. The simple truth is there is no direct relationship between the cost of providing a university education and the fees charged. I've written about this as a, as a researcher. We see the Australian case, the US case and whatnot. Business schools and law schools are more expensive than architecture schools. Business schools and law schools have large classes. The students buy their own books. They hardly ever use the library. Um, the cheapest programs should be business and law but the most expensive other than medical schools are in fact business. So the preparedness of people to pay in the market for higher education directly relates to expected return. So you graduate law or business, you expect to earn more money, therefore you're prepared to pay for the degree. So deep down, everyone knows, the students, their parents, the university side all know that ultimately what we're selling is certification. Um, but from the point of view of particularly undergraduate students, the campus experience is hugely important. I did think that Waseda's communications talking about this is a multi-year thing, multi-generational, we build buildings, we do this, we do that. All of that was really a bit of a distraction. You could flip that argument completely and say, exactly. And we haven't had the experience everybody else had. So future generations who will have that and past generations should cross-subsidize cross those now who are missing out. And that is a powerful argument. Um, the other economic truth is that the things that are most valuable to many Waseda students in terms of the, say the club experience, the campus experience, accessing the sports <laughs> facilities or whatever, actually, are either an expensive fixed cost, you know, they, they have to be maintained, um, or they're actually relatively low cost. So the largest part of the expenses of any university is the personnel budget. And we have academic tenure, professors are, are employed, and like I said, you know, 
working harder than they ever had to, to deliver this. So they have to get paid. That said, uh, where the fees have collapsed, where universities are dependent on international students, such as in the Australian case, um, there is a temporary 15% pay cut being imposed on staff by many institutions. Some other institutions are sacking hundreds of people. So it's messy. Uh, I think the takeaway from, from a number of your groups was that if the university just simply can't afford to cut fees, um, just be honest about it. And I think that's a critical thing. Uh, like so many issues in our personal lives too, it's not so much even the error or the mistake, it's how you deal with it or the painful news, just kind of out with it and, and, and deal with it. And less is more, just get to the point. Uh, I, my, my overall impression with the Wasada communications in general is that they haven't learned that fundamental rule that I learned in my very first class in introduction to journalism. And that is who, what, when, where, why, upfront 25 words or less in the first sentence. What's new? Tell us now. Um, I'm sure you saw in all the Wasada communications, no child left behind, even the UN sustainability goals got a mention. And then Wasada's news normally came at the bottom. It's always a problem in a text if you have to go to the bottom to find out what the new is. So always open with the news. Um, remember my PhD supervisor said to me about my PhD thesis, you're not writing a mystery novel. We don't want to know who done it and what they did and why on the last page. We want to know upfront to decide whether we're going to read this damn thing at all. And given those 80,000 words, that's a, a fairly important thing. So yeah, lead with what's new, lead with the rationale, then the explication the explanation as we follow. Okay, now I'm, I'm looking at our time. Uh, clearly I was ambitious, of course, in trying to pile so much kind of um, content there. Uh, I have just a couple of minutes left. I don't want to run over. Uh, so I'm just going to open with the discussion of exploring place and nation brands. And I'd like to bring this back for a topic in the Japanese case. Um, next week, and again related to COVID communications, because we talk so much about branding place and nation, and it's a lot about destination branding, getting people to come. But all countries, and indeed states in many places and cities, have had a konaide, don't come, sudden stance. And they've locked down their countries. In the Japanese case, they won't even let their long term permanent residents who own houses and have families here re enter. So, you know, how do you brand your place or your nation post corona when you just told people um, you're not very important to us, don't come? So that's an open question. So just to give a bit of closure here, I'll just share the screen very briefly and uh, simply show our first couple of slides just to speak to why these things are important. Um, First thing I want to emphasize is just simply that um, from the 19th century, the whole nationalism project has really been about nations branding themselves, national logos and symbols, that all nations, when they set out to make a nation, literally had people sitting around saying, mm, what's going to be our coat of arms? What's going to be our flag? Uh, trying to make these very significant decisions. All new nations have to do this. Developing national narratives. One of the interesting things is, well, we're a nation. We've got to have a national cookbook, literally. You know, a country like Hungary decided had a, had a project to develop the national cookbook and paprika got into every recipe and now all Hungarian cooking has to have paprika in it, for example. So, of course, historically, a lot of the branding was inward oriented, that actually populations were quite diverse and they were trying to convince people, no, you really are Czech or you really are Polish. You know, you're not hybrid German, um, Jewish, Polish, you are a Pole, for example. Okay, and then to project those brand stories abroad through public diplomacy. At the same time, in liberal democracies, citizens are free to be what they want to be and to do what they want to do with the national narratives and the symbols. And I think a lot of people in less liberal countries misunderstand places like the United States and France and Britain. They look at these societies and think they're tearing themselves apart. No, they're actual vibrant democracies where people are free to challenge national narratives. So there's a lot of resilience there, 
which is often lost. There's also very complex relationships to regional and city identities. In the Israeli case, they talk about the Tel Aviv bubble, you know, politically and everything. Tel Aviv is vastly different from the political dynamics nationally. Um, and national storytelling is often tales of modernization. So you can have even ancient civilizations, but the nation state is relatively new. I think many people were surprised that actually last year, well, oops, sorry, last year was the 100th anniversary of the founding of Finland. People said, well, Finland hasn't been there forever, um, but it actually was an independent nation for only a century and the symbolism of the Finnish state there. Um, Turkey is a fascinating case of highly personalized around um, Kemal Ataturk and a modernizing nationalism, which is grounded in the 1920s. And actually this is in um, Turkish Cyprus, where it's a, it's a cert, um, Turkish identity is strongly asserted. And of course the, uh, the cult of um, Ataturk is projected. Now, nations come together, they have to come up with the symbols. This is the Australian one. You made the coat of arms. Um, Australia was made by actually putting a whole bunch of states together. So you have the uh, state coats of arms there and you have some animals and you have some flora, your flora and fauna. By the way, you can go to a restaurant in Sydney and you can get the um, coat of arms dinner special where they serve kangaroo steak and roast emu. So one of the few countries in the world that eats its coat of arms. And then of course, one of the strongest brands in the world I and mean, strongest logos is of course the Union Jack, um, which itself was a political act. The Union Jack is really um, a unifying symbol uh, after the forced union of Scotland um, into the United Kingdom. And then of course, Sex Pistols come along and they play with this um, in a very irreverent way and ironically did more for Britannia and the British flag as a logo um, to freshen up the brand than anyone else. So often if we adopt a rather liberal posture, we can get um, ultimately more brand traction, more brand equity rather than less. If we try to over control it, we often just simply make it staid and boring and not connecting with other audiences. So I'll pick up on this next week. We'll talk about diverse sources of nation place and brand power. Um, I might do a uh, two camera piece as well, so we don't fall too far behind. But I think this is an interesting thing to actually interact on next week in relation to post um, COVID-19 as well. So I'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much. And I'm really sorry about the technical glitch. I just have no idea what happened um, here at my end. I think it was a network dropout issue, which just caused a freeze. So. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, a final thing, I've had messages from some people that they haven't been able to message me through the site and they uh, couldn't post directly in the forum. I experimented, several people, um, uh, Elsa, for example, several people wrote to me and I've actually gone in and checked individual permissions and I couldn't find any reason for it not working. It may have been a temporary network issue when you were using it because Moodle connects to the student database. Try again. If you're still having problems, let me know and I'll talk to the IT folks. I'm very keen to get that sorted. So post your thoughts um, based on your breakout group discussion there on Waseda and COVID communications. That's an ongoing conversation. Thank you very much.